dinner around the kitchen table. Boy, that can stir some serious emotions. Sometimes it reminds us of life past, and sometimes it gives us hope of life in the future with our current families. Our guest today is world-renowned chef John Foltz. He has mastered the art of what it means to be around a kitchen table. It's not only about the food, it's about the family, it's about the conversation. And you may notice, we're here at his location where he has events every weekend, marriages and wonderful life events. It's White Oak Gardens and Estates, and he's been so gracious to allow us to film our season here. So we say thank you to him. But we want you to know something about him you may not know. He is from a big family, and he didn't wake up a very successful chef. His family endured crisis, and God came in the midst of their crisis and showed himself in such a way that John's not just a chef. He's a chef talking about his faith every day with a grateful heart to God. So don't miss this amazing story about how God intersected in his life and did a miracle in front of their eyes. Today we are here with world-renowned chef John Foltz. He has traveled the globe taking the Louisiana culinary, I mean, just delights all over the world. Not only has he done that, he has, he has cooked for presidents, Pope John Paul II, and he has, in his off time, he is at award-winning revolution in New Orleans, hosting the thousands of people that come through that marvelous city every week. But not only that, he has never forgotten his roots as, as we are here at White Oak Gardens. I'm gonna talk to him about his early childhood life and the amazing thread that God has weaved in his life as he's become a, a, just a, a well-known chef. And, um, but it goes back to St. James Parish long, long ago. Um, you're from a large family. You went to church. Talk about being from a, a big family and your, your dad used to hunt and hide and right, right. how it all started for you. I guess I, I guess I can say by the grace of God, I mean, I, I've lived a, a life that's just been so incredible, so unplanned, uh, so, so defined by uh, by another's hand, certainly not mine. But yeah, I grew up in a, uh, in a loving place. I grew up in St. James Parish, which is uh, one of the uh, uh, first, by the way, church parishes uh, on, on the Mississippi River, founded over 250 years ago. St. James uh, Catholic Church was uh, one of the first Acadian uh, churches, and we lived right in that area. We were swamp dwellers, so to speak. My father was a Cajun trapper. He trapped for us for a living. French was spoken in our home. Uh, and. Uh, the extended family all lived within a stone's throw of each other. So we grew up in, in, uh, in an area, first of all, that loved uh, the fact that they were French-speaking Acadians. They loved the fact that they were Catholic. They loved the fact that they were all very in tune to their, to their church and their family. Uh, and it was, a, uh, it was a, a time where people really understood the need to connect and work with each other and share with each other. So uh, that's the foundation I stand on today. I've never forgotten it. It was a great uh, upbringing. And, and of course, I know you know the, the tragedy in my life. My mother died when I was yes. very young. And uh, my mom just happened to be nine months pregnant. Uh, her first child had died. So she was on child number 10 at this time. And it was raining on this particular day in 1955, and Mary Fasho, this African-American woman, was walking down the little lane going to do her own work, and she saw my mom hanging clothes in the rain nine months pregnant. And, it had to be hot. Yeah, and she, yeah, it was May, so she walked through the gate, and I asked her mom to sit down. She would hang the clothes on the line, and she said the thing that really made her stop and look was that everything on the clothesline was diapers. So she knew that this woman had just a bunch of babies in this house, right? But my mom uh, uh, sat on the step and let, let her hang the clothes as she had asked to do. And after she had finished, she came over and my mom grabbed her hand and said, if anything ever happens to me, I just hope somebody like you would look in on these children. And less than, what, three weeks later, my mother was dead. 
And Mary actually came and knocked on our door two weeks after we buried my mother to say, I'm here to fulfill a promise I made to look in on these children. And my dad was shocked by the fact that he, he had no there. idea. He had no idea. This was a message between two mothers. This was a message between Mary, who had six children of her own, and my mom, who had uh, eight and, and the two that died. And of course, my mother died with the baby, uh, the breach. And uh, Mary was with us for 25 years. She was the mother we knew. She was the mother who reared us. She was the mother who taught me how to cook. <laughs> uh, I said today I still stand on Mary's recipe. So uh, it, it, it certainly makes us all realize the importance of people in our lives and the way God will always be there to, to help us. I reflect on this quite often. Even though we had my grandmothers and my godmothers and we had everybody in the neighborhood, it was an African-American saint that God sent over to take care of us and he did that for a reason. And when I reflect on my life, I realize that it was Mary's upbringing and management of us as a family, as an African-American woman who was raising her children and us, that it taught me diversity, it taught me the uniqueness of our area. It taught me about the specialty of our food. It taught me about how important faith was because Mary was a black Catholic, which in those days, most of the African-Americans were Baptists. So it makes me realize the, uh, just how God intertwines his life in our lives and puts things in place that makes, uh, uh, makes things happen for us that gives us a story to tell. Well, and you think about what your family was going through, how is the role of your father so important? Because I think fathers are, are so critical. So he's sitting here, he's got all these kids, and she walks in and, and, and helps. But you had to have a heck of a father to be able to hold everything together. You know, the greatest thing about my dad that I remember and will be the last thing I remember, um, is the day we got back from the graveyard with burying mom and we, dad, I'll never forget, was laying on the bed. He had an ice pack on his head and here was all these eight children, uh, the twins, two years old. And we're in there, my grandmother's in the house as well. We just got back from the graveyard and dad, I'll never forget, he kind of sat up in the bed and he kind of said, come here. And he says, don't y'all worry, we're all going to stay together as a family. Now, I was only eight years old, but I knew what that meant, because in those days, if a mother died and the dad took over the family, you spread the kids out to the godmothers and the godfathers that were so important. And the, yeah, children, even so young, realize what's going on. Don't ever think they don't, because even today, at 70-something years old, it's still, I still remember that day. And my sister saying, my sister Ruth saying, Dad, who's gonna say the rosary tonight? And, and it reminds me about, about how early faith is instilled in a child. You don't wait for a child to be 18 years old to decide if they're gonna have faith. You instill faith. That's what God put us here for. I tell people all over the world that particular part of the story because so often today, parents are allowing children to make decisions in faith when they forget that our baptismal right demands that we set our children on the right path. You talk about the power of community. Let's go to the flood. You didn't flood, but you almost did. <laughs> and you, you, you sat here and you began to cook. You, you went to what you, you know you can do to serve your community. You started cooking. What happened after you started cooking? Yeah, you know, that was a devastating time in Louisiana. And, and like I say, God spared my, my house about a quarter of an inch. But, uh, but the whole area was devastated. And the only thing we could do is cook. And I was lucky enough to have a food manufacturing plant in Donaldsonville that was able to cook hundreds of thousands of pounds of food. It's my biggest business. And at that time, I realized that we could not cook without people. We needed our staff, and most of my staff is African-American in the Donaldsonville area. So they were without electricity, without homes. One of my uh, people came to me and they said, you know what, we're gonna need to set up 
a, a, a dormitory here for our staff. They have, they, have, they have children, they have babies. And I said, well, how are we gonna do that? And one of my girls, Michelle Yark, said, let me handle that. And we turned part of our plant into a daycare center. They needed us and we desperately needed them. We fed thousands upon thousands of people because uh, we had the ability to do it. Companies from all over America started to ship food into us free of charge and said, just cook and give it away. Everybody cared about one another Absolutely. equally. Didn't care what religion you were, what race you were, didn't know what your politics were, nobody could care less. In time of need, it was a great reminder to me personally that it's in these devastating times that really God reaches out and pulls us all together. Well, when you take an environment like that and then you're, you're visiting with Pope John Paul II or you're with a president, what have you learned about just the heart of people in general? We're all needed, you know, we're all needed in, in, in many, many different ways. I, I'm, I, I'm fortunate to have uh, cooked for four presidents of the United States. Uh, I've, I've had the greatest gift that, that God gave me to, uh, to, to meet Pope John Paul at Castel Gandolfo at his residence and have mass with him. And I asked myself the question, you know, how did you get here? How in the world did you get here? I'll never forget being in Russia, opening the first American restaurant in the Soviet Union, and my interpreter, a woman, a young woman, walking with me through the streets of, of Moscow, reached over and grabbed my arm and she says, Chef, when you come back to open your restaurant, would you bring me a Bible? And I said, a Bible? She said, it's very dangerous. It's very dangerous. I said, sure, I'll bring you a Bible. And I did. Didn't think much about it again. Until about 10 or 15 years later, again, I'm in my bed, because I wake up very early, and I just sit up when I realize that God had just sh shook me up for a reason. He reminded me, you didn't go to Russia to feed President Reagan and meet Mikhail Gorbachev and the first American chef to cook in the Soviet Union. And that's the gift I gave you for delivering a Bible to one of my people. Heaven's opened up at the perfect time to allow you to understand why we're here why these gifts were given to us. What do we do with them? How do we pay back the gifts that God has given us? And um, it's amazing, it's absolutely amazing that once you come to understand that everything is guided by that, uh, it's just a different life that you're gonna lead from that point on. And that's the way I feel about my life today. Let's talk about the importance of the family around a table, no matter what the family is. It could be a single mom, it could be a, a huge family like you came from. The family, how important is it to get together and, and share a meal in today's busy world? Well, it's the greatest loss that we have on this earth today. The greatest single loss that we can attribute most of the issues, and that's the loss of family around the table. Saying grace before meals, listening to mom and dad with their instruction, mom and dad listening to the daughter or the son sitting at the table, grieving about being uh, picked on at school and explaining to them how you handle that. We've lost the family table. We've lost the family meal. Uh, Jesus, Jesus really tried to show us the importance of it at the Last Supper. You know, uh, not only did he set the Last Supper table up, uh, but there was a reason for it. There was instruction given for the world to exist on from that point on. There's so much that happens independently when people sit around the table, begin with a grace before meals, join hands, and it shows love to the children as well. It shows that love and it also, also shows them something uh, that's very, very important, that the mom and dad are the head of the family, and we're here to solve your problems, and we're here to come talk to us. And young parents today don't really realize the importance of that because they didn't have it in their own lives. We're two generations away from the kitchen table. 
and it's a sad, sad loss in our lives. So I would say, get back to the table with your kids. Have dinner. Have, have dinner. Listen to them. Now, don't, don't, don't sit at the table lecturing to them. Listen to them. Tell me about your day. And through that, all of a sudden, all of this world of uh, instruction comes together that they'll one day hopefully pass on to theirs. Okay, I'm gonna ask you one last fun question. So you started off in St. James Parish. You have since traveled the world numerous times. What is your favorite part of coming home to Louisiana? <laughs> what is it that you just can't wait to get back to? Red beans and rice and smoked sausage. I tell you what, I look, I, I, I'm gonna be in Germany in a couple of weeks. The, the whole country is devoted to sausages. But while I'm there, I'm gonna be thinking of that good smoked sausage sitting on top of a bed of red beans, uh, company around the table. You know, uh, I love to travel the world, but boy, do I love to come home. You know, there's no place like it. <laughs> now that you know the amazing story behind Chef John Foltz's family, you'll know why he loves to take care of people in our community. He does many things. You could easily support his efforts by buying one of his many books, but he also helps feed the hungry. So if you would like to feed the hungry by donating to Chef John Foltz and his team, they cook for people. I mean, really good food and donate. Go to lifeonpurpose.tv and help feed people in our community.